I think it's a bit sad that as a design theorist, I will barely talk about design. Um, but um, I will, on the other hand, uh, actually focus more on the first word in the term transition design a little bit, maybe as opposed to Terry or Dan, who mainly talked about um, design practice. Um, and I will try to look at the notion of transition, um, its interpretations or uses in a broader political context. So, um, as already mentioned, uh, transition design as a framework is composed of different approaches and methods derived from social sciences, systems theory, management, um, various trends of design for sustainability or social innovation, and so on. Um, however, it's not just an eclectic uh, methodological assemblage with no overarching logic. Um, what actually glues all these distinct areas of knowledge, knowledge production and production of the artificial together um, is the positioning of this framework within what we can call the transition movement. Um, the transition movement uh, is itself quite a varied endeavor that spans across social and ecological movements, civil organizations and academic institutions. And it asks actually for nothing less than a deep and multi-layered social transformation that would enable humanity uh, to overcome the current social and environmental crisis. And the Transition Design Initiative tries to mobilize design as a discipline to join this movement and to help enact such change. And of course, to approach design um, as a discipline aimed to induce change within society is not new. Um, however, I think that the uh, association with the transition movement differentiates transition design from some earlier or other strands of practice by establishing a certain idea about what kind of society we should strive for. That is to say that neither the transition movement nor transition design are by any means neutral in terms of politics. Or in other words, they are openly normative. Uh, the transition movement uh, is characterized by a set of values and ethical stances uh, such as strong opposition to capitalism, colonialism, patriarchy, extractivism and other facets of being in the world um, that had emerged as constitutive elements of Western modernity. But that said, um, it is important to mention that the very notion or concept of transition um, is even broader um, and its general meaning reaches beyond um, the kind of transition envisioned by the transition movement. In social sciences, the word transition is defined in quite a neutral way as a radical structural change of, so of a social system which results from a co-evolution of economic, cultural, technological, ecological and institutional shifts of various scales and on multiple levels. So in the most general terms, then, transition is simply a long-term process, the outcomes of which um, cannot be completely pred predicted upfront, and it is a process that spans across one or, or even more generations. And because the, um, this, the outcomes of this, of this process cannot be predicted upfront, um, that is where actually design or transition design comes in with an ambition to conceive of some micro scale interventions in our everyday lives that could help us instigate change uh, in these long term and large scale civilizational patterns, as uh, Terry talked about it before. To understand the nature of change that transition design aims for, um, however, it may be important to consider the differences among the variety of discourses of transition in general. Um, in various policy or research papers, uh, we may encounter the expression transition to sustainability. But just like in the case of the word transition, the notion of sustainability is far from homogenous uh, and it can be understood or defined in different ways. 
And in my view, uh, it is exactly this uh, differentiation between various understandings of sustainability that can actually help us understand the shades and levels of how radical a transition could be. Or in other words, uh, the differentiation of sustainability is, again, in my view, somewhat mirrored in the various discourses of transition. So provisionally, we can hold on to a distinction between the discourses of the so-called weak sustainability and strong sustainability. The concept of weak sustainability considers natural resources, social relationships or cultural values to be quantifiable by financial units of economic capital. On the other hand, the discourses of the so-called strong sustainability refuse such mutual exchangeability and, on the contrary, they insist on a fundamental irreducibility um, of the different kinds of value. It can also be said that while both these strands of theory or policy definitely share the ambition to mitigate climate change and other environmental problems, the weak approach to sustainability assumes it can be done uh, while preserving the protocols and parameters of the current political and economic systems, such as unconstrained economic growth. The main hope of the proponents of such discourses, then, is that thanks to innovative technologies, regulations and incentives, it will soon be possible to separate or uh, decouple this growth from the consumption of energy and material. By contrast, the strong approach to sustainability is based on the idea of a certain hierarchy between the economic, social and ecological systems. It claims that economy is actually embedded within the social and ecological systems. So, while weak sustainability effectively subordinates um, the uh, natural or social systems to the logic of economic exchange, strong sustainability turns this idea upside down and shows that, on the contrary, we need to subordinate economy to ecology. And therefore, from this perspective, we have to accept that the global uh, civilization has to change, that it has to limit, for example, its levels of production and consumption, and that most likely it has to abandon, um, for instance, the idea of endless economic growth, because in physical terms, the planet we live on is simply finite. Another way of distinguishing these two lineages of the sustainability discourses is to say that while the more conservative approach to sustainability assumes that the climate crisis is solvable within the existing paradigm of neoliberal capitalism and liberal democracy, the more radical approach considers that the climate crisis is practically inevitable. It, say, it states then that the wicked problems that uh, Terry talked about, the wicked problems of our civilizations, can't be solved, but only managed. But first, uh, let's have a closer look at the discourse of weak sustainability. It is still the most widely accepted and dominant approach to sustainability and environmental politics. Um, in the language of international organizations, these, this understanding of sustainability is usually derived from the concept of sustainable, sustainable development, uh, a notion that was first introduced in 1987 in the so-called Brundtland Report issued by the United Nations. And according to this report, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This report, however, doesn't go too far in terms of changes or interventions governments and international organizations need to proceed with in order to comply with this very principle. Um, in essence, the report served as a means to somewhat acknowledge the future challenges, but also really to preserve the status quo. Uh, indeed, in another part of the report, the Brundtland Commission calls for a new era of economic growth, and I quote, growth that is strong, but at the same time environmentally and socially sustainable, end quote. 
Over time, um, these thoughts have really consolidated within the market, as well as, for example, the European legislation. And they've become kind of a stable component uh, of the rhetoric of most private, but also public entities, uh, if they even have like at least some ambition uh, to address sustainability issues. The European Union has established the notion of sustainable development as a crucial principle of all its policies in the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997. And most recently, it has confirmed these goals in the European Green Deal from 2019. Um, the European Green Deal, as you probably know, assumes that the European Union will reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and that it will be able to, uh, like I said before, separate economic growth from the consumption of energy and natural resources. And the same logic then underlies the goals of sustainable development articulated by the UN in 2015. What can be considered a kind of slight a rhetorical advancement uh, in comparison to the concept of sustainable development is a uh, growing emphasis on, uh, of the international policy-making bodies on the so-called just transition. And thus, we return to the central notion of, of, this, um, of this paper. So generally speaking, just transition stands for social inclusivity and support for communities or regions that will be economically affected um, by an envisioned industrial and energetic transformation. This notion has been around at least in the 1990s when the danger of unemployment uh, or forced requalification of workers was first articulated as one of the consequences, uh, consequences of different environmental policies. And today, um, these policies cannot really omit an explicit claim uh, to just transition if they are uh, to secure credibility. Most importantly, um, these developments indicate that gradually a link has really been reinforced between ecological and social sustainability while reflecting on, these, mm, on the kind of antagonistic nature of uh, all kinds of transformative processes. This is, after all, what the so-called transition management, um, where the so-called transition management originates um, as a set of tools and procedures to actually control and implement uh, some multifaceted long-term change. Nevertheless, the adoption of a certain transition discourse doesn't in itself constitute a transgression of the established concept of sustainable development or the economic or political status quo more generally. The institutionalized approach to sustainability and to just transition remains based mainly on a straightforward, one-dimensional and fairly technocratic idea of decarbonization, only suitable uh, to rich post-industrial economies, if that. In fact, as you probably know, um, the findings of climate scientists, progressive economists or various international institutions show that this is practically impossible to keep an economy based on exponential uh, growth going as globally. Humanity has already transgressed uh, its safe operating space or the so-called planetary boundaries. The decoupling theory that the um, European policies actually rely on then prove inadequate by actually solely focusing on technological decarbonization. Crucial as it is, of course, um, the concept of carbon, uh, carbon neutrality doesn't take into account surging material consumption that is expecting to further accelerate um, as the global population grows, aspiring to ever higher standards of living. Even a recent study of the European Environmental Agency, an institution that is actually closely associated with the European governance structures, really comes to this conclusion. And uh, while the well-being of people all around the world needs to remain a crucial objective of international policymaking, it seems that the planetary ecological condition forces us to reconsider some of the basic economic uh, mechanisms, the way value is conceptualized, 
or the way planetary resources are distributed. And this is precisely where the notion of a radical transition connected to the strong approach to sustainability comes in. Um, it is a kind of transition envis envisioned by the transition movement, as I mentioned earlier, that, um, and that I have actually identified as kind of a general political context of transition design more specifically. However, even the discourses of the radical transition uh, within the transition movement vary uh, in terms of their philosophy or politics. And uh, I think that no matter how subtle, uh, these differences are worth unpacking in order to understand what we actually want to achieve um, as when designing for transition. So one of the notes um, of the transition movement uh, has been, for example, the so-called Great Transition Initiative. Um, dating back about two decades and still ongoing, uh, it is an international initiative of scientists and activists developing new paradigms of social organization and some transition scenarios that might lead to it. This initiative, in general, rejects capital accumulation and resulting social injustices, and it envisions a sort, a, a, some kind of post-capitalist society that will mainly be based on uh, decentralization of power, cultural pluralism, and active citizenship. However, while emphasizing this multi-layered a civil movement, the members of this initiative are still very optimistic uh, about the capacities of strong states and international organizations that, in their view, should coordinate these diverse small-scale initiatives. A similar reliance on the regulatory mechanisms of the state or international political bodies can be also found in the program devised by activists and politicians uh, grouped within the European political movement, GM25. The blueprint for Europe's just transition, and here the word just transition comes again, uh, can be read as a critical response uh, to the European Green Deal of the European Commission. Unlike the official plan of the EU, uh, DiEM25's program is based on the idea of a deep economic restructuring that won't really uh, leave much space for a conservation of the status quo. Um, as opposed to financial support for private sector, for instance, this blueprint proposes a massive mobilization of public investment um, with clear benefits for citizens rather than corporations. It also proposes to abandon the very simplistic indicator of the gross domestic product and to measure progress by the so-called genuine progress indicator instead. And thus, the assessment of social well-being ceases to be restricted to economic prosperity only and it allows to embrace values that are irreducible to financial capital as the uh, notion of strong sustainability um, kind of claims. However, uh, the transition movement is certainly not limited to academic and political initiatives in the global north. Um, as the anthropologist Arturo Escobar shows, it is strongly present uh, within the emancipatory discourses of South American intellectuals and indigenous communities. Um, following this very ethos, Escobar himself opposes not only capitalism and its extractivist practices, but also the very concept of development, uh, to which the notion of transition is proposed as some kind of critical counterpoint. Um, to Escobar, the idea of development is still present in the concept of sustainable development today, uh, serves as a tool for the wealthy first world to actually subordinate and colonize what had previously been called the third world. And so here, the radicality of transition or the transition discourse reaches its peak as Escobar calls for a deep re-evaluation re of the fundamental principles that modern Western civilization has been based on, be it anthropocentrism, patriarchy, or exclusions of exclusion of those who don't fit Western norms. Instead, he envisions a transition to a society based on horizontal mutual support, acceptance 
of interdependence between human and non-human systems or a plurality of autonomous communities. And returning to the European context once again, but staying a little bit with this ideal of emergent self-organization, I'll mention one last agent uh, of the transition movement, the so-called Transition Towns Initiative. This initiative was founded in two towns in Ireland and Great Britain by an activist named Rob Hopkins in uh, 2008. Um, and its formation was motivated by a twofold risk. Um, first, by the threat of the so-called peak oil, or a situation of sudden and irreversible scarcity of oil. And second, by the perils posed by climate change. And Hopkins called for a creation of autonomous, independent and resilient communities able to secure all that is necessary for survival. Energy, food, finance, education, culture, what have you. The locus and focus of this initiative um, are families or small communities caring for a bioregion they live in. And though these towns and cities form a network uh, to exchange their know-how, they're fairly distrustful to governance structure exceeding the local scale, such as the state or international organizations, unlike, for example, the Great Transition Initiative or even uh, some of the political bodies that I mentioned before. So, in summary, as we have seen, the discourses of transition vary not only on the level of compliance with or rejection of the economic and political status quo, but also in terms of scale and scope or institutional and governance infrastructure they want to rely on. Um, on the one hand, a cooperation with established entities and authorities may be viewed as a continuation of some deep-rooted injustices, but on the other hand, relocalization and claims to autonomy pose, might pose the risk of protectionism and some counterproductive conservatism. Transition design, coming back to the uh, very topic of this, uh, of this conference, Transition design explicitly refers to actually most of these initiatives at once, including uh, some of those relating to actually the existing governance structures. Um, and uh, transition design proposals cite all of these initiatives as its sources of inspiration. Transition design itself concurs with the nested holistic model of cosmopolitan localism, uh, just like Terry Irvin talked about it, that connects local everyday practices with global context. However, in my view, it still seems to be rather agnostic in terms of particular power dynamics among various agents. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is definitely a crucial component of the transition movement as it proposes a framework that could allow for change to actually materialize. Um, and it will certainly be a messy process. Um, with, re with the last reference to Kim Stanley Robinson's novel, Ministry for the Future, that narrates the story of an utmost chaotic civilizational transformation, it is just important to acknowledge that any realistic transition will have to count in all the entrenched ambiguities of the current system with overwhelming political tensions. Thank you. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I think that actually, like mm, the discipline and the practice of design is pretty much occupied by these traditional approaches like design thinking, service design, human-centered design, or even designing for social innovation. And I think they are actually fine. I don't want to tell they are bad or something, but they, but to some extent, they replicate like this unsustainable status quo. Mm. And I just want to ask, what should be actually like the ultimate argument for switching to this to this transition perspective, actually, for designers. Hmm. Um, well, I'm not sure. I think I still think that even like within the transition design framework, um, and I think that it's just that it that like I said, like transition design um, tries to acknowledge or address some of the political tensions 
within what it means to, to design, um, I think that that's the kind of, that's the most important thing about like transition design. And it's, I, and I, like I tried to um, show it is, there's still like so many things to unpack really about like what transition means and what kind of political shade or mm, what, what, what are the, uh, the politics of this, of, this of this design movement. And I think that all those like uh, methods and principles from, I don't know, design thinking and human-centered design can potentially be useful. But it's just that um, I think that, uh, I mean, what is most valuable about transition design for me is really like being um, very careful or, um, yeah, careful about the political um, decisions that you make through or like by within these methods that in design thinking have sort of like um, been used as, you know, these kind of, um, as you have like guidelines in a textbook and you just like use those like interviews and, and you don't really like think about the power dynamics within the groups and between the stakeholders. We've been talking a bunch about stakeholders, but obviously there are different like power positions you know, that, that differentiate these stakeholders. And I think that's the most important thing for me at least, um, what transition design can address uh, consciously. You know, like using maybe these, all these like methods or like shaping them in a way that is like, yeah, politically conscious, I would say. Okay, so we can actually use like methods from service design, but we are using them from a very reflective political stance, let's say, as a designers. Okay, any other questions? Michal, then, oh. <laughs> okay, uh, hello. I have this question because uh, talking about this, you know, there is this, um, uh, my question will be focused on, is there some perspective in the middle? Because what I see... Between what? That's what I will explain, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I see here like two perspectives. I see there are some people, you know, who, who can be designers, you know, artists, uh, researchers, you know, so they have this own personal perspectives, you know, mm -hmm. which they can like approach something as a transition, as transition design. But then what you mostly presented was this like global perspective, you know, of institutions, as United Nations, we, I don't know who here, but we somehow feels it fails in its purpose because you are showing us, you know, we are talking this about from 70s, 80s, you know, and still like what is really happening actually. So, so for me, my question is right now because you have these like big political questions, you know, which are discussed on this uh, big political institutions as for example UN if you, you can or cannot agree if this is a political institution but it is and then this small like very personal level of each of us you know who usually you know transit themselves into kind of like activists or pacifists you know that's very much like this so is there anything as a as this middleman you know as this kind of middle perspective yeah I think um, I think both of these I mean I would hope or at least I think it's what I'm also like interested in um, and maybe it's uh, maybe it's the um, how you use design maybe on this like regime level of like policy design for example and I think that basically connects um, the individual agency with maybe some like institutional organizational kind of system level practices so it's about yeah, uh, maybe use, yeah, I don't know, like using design strategically, maybe in policy des design, I think that's maybe the level in between that I'm actually kind of like interested in, like um, um, how to use this even in the context maybe of those kind of like ugly, um, kind of unjust institutions and how to like steer some of their, like some of, some of their agency towards kind of like more desirable outcomes or something. So I think that there, may, there might be like a locus for a designer as kind of an individual uh, kind of transition agent um, to maybe like work in between those, um, those levels, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Not saying that it's always possible. I think that Tobias was first. Yeah, I was mostly curious about the, the complexity issue, like how do you deal with an issue that is so big and interdisciplinary? How do you kind of go from not having a solution to solving such a huge, huge problem? How do you kind of start? I think that was, that's maybe a little bit more of a question for Terry Irvin, who kind of, I think, uh, tried to talk about that 
a little bit more in detail. So I'm not sure I will be able to give a, a very accurate answer uh, to that right now. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, yeah, that actually, I don't know, to me, what, what Terry presented was maybe more of an answer to your question. Okay, and Amela? Thank you. Just a quick question. As a designer, you are, of course, working in the multidisciplinary teams. And I am wondering how you talk with people with economic background from economics, which really it is religion and it is the way they are educated. And mm -hmm. uh, there's an infinite, <laughs> indefinite uh, grow, profit grow. Uh, we're just preparing uh, workshops in our department on sustainability. And then my colleague with natural science background and engineering with engineering, he said, just I can't talk. Basically, I stopped talking with my friends with background in economics because mm. we wouldn't be friends. You can't uh, kind of explain your <laughs> argument because they, they really kind of brainwashed you know, mm. or, or something. Maybe we are brainwashed. Mm. I mean, but we can't, how to find this common ground? Do you have any? any? <laughs> I, I don't, but I think that Matthew Malicha, maybe who will speak, uh, who will have a um, contribution this afternoon, will talk maybe a little bit more about these kind of like practical issues. Um, but I don't know, like from my experience or like from my point of view, it's that people from like the creative disciplines or like from design or even like design theory can sometimes just like bring in this kind of maybe sometimes productive like naivety that you just like ask questions that um, mm, that maybe sound I mean that's yeah that for example yeah I mean last year I was talking to some like insurance experts about insurance and I was just like asking these like naive questions like how far it can, it can actually go you know like how can we like insure uh, for like these kind of slow um, events such as drought or deforestation or mm, sea level rise and things like that and it's like because like when you ask these questions they're kind of stuck you know and they're like uh I'm not sure how to answer that question. And that's like where the, inst uh, the, where the conversation can start, maybe a little bit. I, I don't know, like, I, this was just like my only experience, like talking about like economists about this, that when you just like ask like questions that are naive or like kind of informed naive enough, then um, something, can, something can happen. And maybe not with those people specifically, but um, maybe you find people that will be like, that will just say, huh, that's an interesting question, um, or something like that, you know? And I've, that's, that's what, what happened to me. So I think it also depends, like all those people are not all the same. Uh, and some of them are a little bit, there's, they're economists, but then they maybe have this, these um, um, kind of established notions in their heads that they w work with, but they're also like open-minded and open to like, other perspectives and I think that exists and then that's not the optimistic kind of scenario where you can just like talk with them and see where it yeah. okay thank you very much I think that's enough actually questions and